I know some people like working with wood and with clay. Um, I'm kind of a heavy metal kind of guy, I guess. I like iron and steel. And I know I'm not going to be winning any awards for the prettiest stove ever made. That's not my goal. I like it to look old and rusty and clunky and steampunky, I guess. But as long as it's functional, that's the main thing. And uh, I'm going to have fun making it anyway. To recap, in my first video on making a wood stove for camping, I outlined the advantages of the stove. In part two, I started the build by taking an ammo box, adding pipe collars, the dividers, and the door opening. Now I'll continue with the final build. So let me give you a little bit more information about the door and its components. First off, the door is made of thick steel and it has three holes in there for air intake. There's a bolt hole in the middle and it's hinged by just a regular door hinge. Um, I just cut that back a little bit. For the air intake, there is this piece of metal which uh, I just cut. It's a circle with a little tab on the end and it has the three holes in it as well and by turning that you can regulate the amount of flow that goes inside your stove. As far as opening and closing the stove, it's this piece here. Now when it's cold, it's pretty simple. You just go like that. But when it's hot, I made this little piece so that it goes through like this. You don't burn your fingers. Open it and closing it. Now the only other thing is there isn't a little piece here which extends the door out and the reason being is I had to allow for the fiberglass insulation that goes around and that's basically it this is a slotted piece so this fits into the slot and there you go for an oven I marked off a section of the lower side to cut out allowing for edge material to fold over I drilled pilot holes and cut out the metal with a metal blade on a jigsaw. The finished opening was just under two inches high once bent. The tray required cutting and bending from a 12 inch by 12 inch sheet of 22 gauge steel. So the next part is making a secondary burn. Um, I need to have so air coming in to the upper part where all the smoke is so it reignites that smoke before it goes out the stovepipe. And what I'm using is typical black iron pipe used for plumbing. This is half inch and I've got two 90 degree elbows, an end cap, and uh, two pieces in between of pipe. And the top one you can see it has uh, holes drilled in it so that's where the air will go out and the air will come in on this elbow at the bottom and what I want to do is I just want to sit it inside like that and there's a hole at the bottom for intake for that hole I used a large drill and then a rounded file to bring it up to the correct diameter but one of my problems is I couldn't find like a hex bolt or something that would fit in that NPT thread. So what I ended up doing is I bought a male to male adapter and a female to female adapter, put them both together and cut off the end. So that gives me something that I can hold it to the side of the, uh, of the stove with. And the female adapter, I also made a little bit of washer as to, uh, what I'm throwing away. It's just a little bit of a spacer just so it's going to be tight against the metal. Let me show you how that works. First you insert the pipe inside the stove and align it with the intake hole. Insert the spacer on the end then attach the coupling from the outside to hold it all in place.
As I filmed the original progress of making this stove, I knew there were some areas where I'd have to go back and explain, and one of them is the hopper. Now, the concept is pretty basic. It's gravity fed, and the components are this funnel or feeder. It's actually a hopper, which is why I call it Dennis, and it just sits on the top. By the way, all this is is a three by four inch duct adapter you can get at any hardware or heating place. And it fits on top of there. And to keep the smoke from coming out, I made a lid and the lid is simply a can of Varathane, one quart cut up, which fits perfect over Dennis. So the top part's pretty easy. You feed through there, but I don't want them just to fall to the bottom. So what I need to do is make some kind of a cage. And looking for ideas, I found this over the door basket at a dollar store. Now it's not exactly what I'm looking for, but it gives me the material to work with. And so I'm gonna play around with this, see if I can make a cage for the hopper. My idea was to cut out the wires of the basket and realign them with the correct spacing. However, in hindsight, I think it would have been easier just to buy lengths of 1 8 inch diameter steel rod and bend them to suit. This, I get it out and it's a really tight fit. You just get it out through the door. That's my hopper cage, I'll call it. And what it is, it's that metal basket, the, uh, the steel from a metal basket and I've spaced those eight millimeters apart and then put straps across each side and riveted it together. And there's also, I'll show you a close up of that. There's also a little piece below as a spacer. And I've wrapped that in sheet metal and just made a little box. And that's what the, uh, the pellets are gonna drop in. And the reason it's eight millimeters is with the space of those steel rods. There's about a four millimeter gap. So the pellets just fall in there and they'll stay in there until they're burned. So that's the theory with that. However, you can't just pour them down there because then the, the pellets would just overflow the cage, they'd be everywhere and there'd be no consistency. So it needed a third part. And that third part is this. And what this is, is a little piece of a tailpipe. Two and a half inch tailpipe from any auto store. I cut off a bit of that and I peened around the edge so I had a lip. And I've got three tabs in there, which I'll show you later, which stop it from falling down. That way it's a specific distance below the hopper. Let me just show you how that works. So I feed it in the top and it falls down and hopefully you can see it falls down to a height about there. Take that out again and just show you in the cage what that means is that it's going to that distance. That way the pellets still build up in the cage but they don't overflow. There are a consistent amount of pellets at all times which means a consistent burn. And also inside is my bottom. And these are tent stakes, stainless steel tent stakes I picked up at a dollar store. And I've just riveted those to a metal plate. And uh, what that's to do is it prevents the bottom from burning out, but it also gives flow. So air flow can go over the top and through the bottom as well. And not only that, in theory, as the ashes collect in this, I should be able to take this out, slide it out, and then get rid of the ash. That's what I hope is going to happen anyway. And that's exactly what did happen. By tilting the stove a little, you can slide out the ash trough for easy clean out. And the other thing I need to do, and I haven't done yet, is work on the legs. Now, this is just a regular door hinge. And when you remove the post, you get two halves like that. Now what I want to do is I've got some 
quarter inch rod and it's a little tight right now but it should fit through those holes I just have to ream them out a little bit and, and uh, in order for that to work I'm just going to attach these to the side I'll cut them off a bit and uh, these hinges will be guiding the legs so that's the next step I drilled four sets of holes using a 5 32nd inch drill then attached the hinge halves with number 10 round head machine screws and nuts I also peened in finishing nails on each hinge end to act as stops for the leg insertion. The legs were bent in a vise with soft jaw pads. I made a metal bending sleeve from angle iron to assist in making the straight bend. Minor adjustments were made by hand in a straight vise. It took a little bit of tweaking to get the angles right. And one more thing before I do the test is I want to see the fire. I can't have a stove and not see fire. It just doesn't seem natural to me. So I've got a piece of natural mica that I got at a hobby store. And I'm going to have to make a little bit of a window for it. A little bit of a frame and a window. So that'll be coming as well. That way I can see. It'll give me a little bit of light and uh, I'll see what's going on in there. Mica comes in irregular shapes and thicknesses. I used a piece that was about half a millimeter thick. Cutting it was easy, as ordinary scissors is all it takes to cut it to the size you need. Making the window involves several parts. You determine the window size by the size of your mica sheet. There should be at least a quarter inch all around for the mica to sit on, plus a series of holes for the bolts. I used fiberglass cloth to form a seal around the window. As it frays easily, I held it in place with green painter's tape. The tape, of course, will burn off at first burn. After positioning the mica, I added spacers around the edge. These metal strips allow for the mica to expand and contract. Next is a metal frame to hold it all in place. After fastening the screws, all that's needed is a little trim with a razor blade to clean up the edges. So that's the basic build. Only thing left to do is to pack it up and try it out. For storage, the oven drawer holds the legs, door latch, and the cooking plate. But under the lid is the main storage area, which includes the hopper extension, a steel cup for boiling, its lid, the pellet cage, and the stove pipe with clamp and rings. After first burn, I also added additional steel to the back wall, the end wall, and the floor. This reduced hot spots from burning a hole through the stove. Now the stove pipe is the only item I bought from an actual camping supply place, and that is a story in its own. When I was in Slab City, I met a guy who lived in a tent and he had the coolest little wood stove I've ever seen. It actually folded up into a bag, the entire wood stove, the pipe, and everything like that. It was absolutely amazing. And I asked where he got it. And he got it from Seek Outside in Colorado. So I had to go and visit Seek Outside myself. Seek Outside is a family business in Grand Junction, Colorado where they make quality stoves, backpacks, and tents. 
I loved their little fold-up backpacking stove, and it was then I became convinced I really needed the roll-up titanium stovepipe. So here's how you use it. First remove the clips and unroll the titanium film across the ground. After the first time you use it, the heat forms the shape of the stovepipe and the metal remembers that shape, making it easy to form a long cylinder without denting the delicate foil. The rest is just the process of rolling it small enough to get the clips on, spacing them evenly along the length of the pipe. Titanium also forms a protective barrier around itself to prevent corrosion. The folded edge makes a great seal from smoke. Titanium also distributes heat well. It's really the perfect material for a portable stove. And there it is. So this is probably the perfect day to give an example of why this stove would work well in the wilderness is because it's been pouring rain all day. So the hopes of getting a campfire and uh, salvage wood out here are zero. Whereas I've got my wood pellets in an ice cream container uh, totally bone dry. In case you wondered, I kept Dennis in the pail with the pellets. I'm sure somebody wants to know how many pellets the stove needs and how long they will burn. There's a lot of variants, but here's what I found so far. In its present state, the hopper takes 50 ounces or six and a quarter cups of hardwood pellets, which is roughly two pounds, four ounces by weight. It takes two hours before you need to reload the pellets again. As mentioned before, using this stove for heating will take a lot of careful testing before I'm even comfortable with sharing the details. So please do not put yourself in danger by trying this indoors. Always put safety first. I really hope you enjoyed this video and please check back for updates. Thanks for watching.